Forgive me, father. Look at you, white man. I comes and I goes. And that's my business. The white folks on hit the old horses. Now you go back and tell your boss that I control the numbers in Harlem. And that's the way it stays. I'll drill the skill of the masters into you and drive out the spirit of jazz. I have to make you play 20 hours straight. Got my girl and the name is Lady. Movies and blacks came to American cities at the turn of the century. Movies were misunderstood. Blacks were unwelcome. Movies at first were no more than topical little chases for vaudeville shows. The standard white reaction to the thousands of blacks who had moved to northern cities was to blame them for their own poverty and ignorance and to pigeonhole them into ghettos in the city and into those ghettos of the mind, racial stereotypes. For migrants from the South, there were complications and ironies. Whites saw them only in the few narrow alleys of behavior that had been shaped many years before as an excuse for slavery and the repressions after the Civil War. Even the movies of those days showed blacks in terms of cliches. They liked watermelon. They suffered when their masters suffered. And they never got mad at anyone. Uh, well, hardly ever. These were the old-fashioned leftovers from Southern lore, the clay from which movie makers expected to make black images. Real life was different more urban, more varied. Black men could fight in the nation's wars, as they did in the Spanish-American War. They could root for the black boxing champion, Jack Johnson, as he pummeled a parade of great white hopes. And they could even lead the annual parade on the boardwalk at Atlantic City. Blacks had moved from the South to cold northern cities, where in the years between 1900 and 1925, they struggled to become a new people. Looking cityward for survival and salvation from lynching and rural poverty, they often found squalor instead of salvation. By the teens of this century, old black stereotypes clearly had no place in America. Who was to define the new Negro, both to himself and to the white world? First on the scene, were old rivals in a contest for nationwide black leadership. Booker T. Washington and his secretary, Emmett J. Scott on one hand, and W.E.B. Du Bois of a new organization, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, on the other. What aroused their anger that summer of 1915 was national reaction to D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, the first real screen epic. It had spectacle, stars, glamour, thrilling drama. More than that, it expressed the most racist southern attitudes and images. The picture promptly blamed the abolitionists for the Civil War, proclaiming that slavery was less an evil than the underpinning of a traditional southern way of life. Said Thomas Dixon, the author of the novel from which the movie was made, My object is to teach the North what it has never known awful suffering of the white man during the dreadful reconstruction period. I believe that almighty God anointed the white men of the South by their suffering to demonstrate to the world that the white man must and shall be supreme. It wasn't only the racial assault of the birth of a nation that enraged blacks. Publicity press releases and posters, clanging bands and marches, 
and press agent gimmickry ballooned the picture into a monstrous celebration of the old-fashioned southern version of the nightmare of reconstruction Dixon even wangled an endorsement from an old schoolmate, the President of the United States. It is like writing history with lightning, and it is all so terribly true. Griffith would spend the rest of his life uncomprehending, making excuses, and counterattacking his critics. In the first flush of anger, black leaders called for censorship. Despite well-publicized legal battles of the NAACP, the birth of a nation was shown pretty much at will, sparking racial hatred by showing ambitious mulattoes lusting after white women. In spite of the clatter over the birth of a nation, one man almost saved the day. In 1916, Biograph, Griffith's old studio, was about to go under. So they cast about for a savior and tested Bert Williams in a witty little sketch which rose high above the conventional blackface manner of the day and ended by making a comment on black institutions and white control. Bert Williams was not universally admired by blacks. He seemed to get along too well with whites and to laugh off too many hurts and to make it in white institutions like the Ziegfeld Follies. There's no disgrace being a Negro, goes his strongest line on racism, but it is sometimes inconvenient. Blacks were at a loss. Protest over continued showings of Birth of a Nation came to nothing. Their only hope was to pull together in common cause and make movies of their own, movies known as race movies. Emmett J. Scott went to work on a film. Shooting started in Tampa, Florida. The birth of a race was not a critical success. Few people saw it after a splashy opening at Chicago's Blackstone Theater. It was the first black attempt to reach a nationwide audience with a major motion picture. It failed, but it also inspired a young black male man in Omaha. George Johnson and his brother Noble, an act at Universal Studios, formed the Lincoln Motion Picture Company to make good movies for black audiences. The men of Lincoln came from a cohesive black middle class in Los Angeles. Men on the make and keenly race conscious. The Lincoln movies with their black versions of the American success myth aimed straight at the heart of this urban black bourgeoisie. These fragments of a seven reel film called By Right of Birth are the only pieces of a Lincoln Motion Picture Company film known to survive today. The star of By Right of Birth, Clarence Brooks, played the part of a black Horatio Alger. The movie was a tale of competent lawyers, smooth, trim women, and for laughs, even a comic chauffeur. Another of their efforts was called The Realization of a Negro's Ambition, the story of a young man who, despite initial setbacks, wins the money and the girl. The Johnsons also made a timeless story based on the true adventures of a black soldier in the border wars against Mexican revolutionaries, the trooper of Troop K. George Johnson recently described the making of the film. They started to work by uh, going down to the costume supply company and rented 
uniforms for soldiers, Mexican sombreros, that went down on Central Avenue and rounded up 25 or 30 ex-Negro government. And they rounded up 40 or 50 Mexicans down in Mexico town. So they went out there and uh, the San Gabriel Wars had a sham battle between the colored troopers, them and the Mexicans. Lincoln did not even survive the early 20s. Their failure revealed every sad fact of life the black companies were forced to live with. Scant capital, few bookings, moonlighting technicians. And their best stars, like Brooks, could take the streetcar to Hollywood and get an occasional part in a real Hollywood movie. Worst of all, the Johnsons could not fight the dozens of fly-by-night hustlers who crept into the fringes of the business with glossy promises that ate up capital and produced no movies. Or like the Ebony Company with its big Chicago studio, white money, black frontmen who retailed the old stereotypes and modern forms, such as spying the spy. secret history until now of George and Noble Johnson and their Lincoln Company and Emmett J. Scott and his grand first stride toward a black cinema. They failed to reach millions of moviegoers, but they opened a trail for black filmmakers to follow. A trail of positive roles, enterprise, and decent black images. If the teens belong to these pioneers, then the years of boom and bust of the 20s belonged to a young black man from the Dakota Prairie, Oscar Michaud. Oscar Michaud's first movie, The Homesteader, opened in 1919 at the beginning of a bright, optimistic period. For the first time since Reconstruction, it seemed that black folks might share in the promise of American life. If its surface brightness covered the poverty underneath, who was there to protest? The World War had ended. Times were good. Harlem was in the midst of an artistic, social, and economic renaissance. There seemed to be a little more money. Black pride rivaled old negative feeling. Black protesters shared the streets with the Ku Klux Klan for the first time. Marcus Garvey's strongly nationalist Universal Negro Improvement Association advocated separatism and the return to Mother Africa and signaled the arrival of new times. Dunbar, Rio, Rosebud, Gate City, Norman, black studios grew with the time. Of them all, Oscar Michaud most answered the needs of the new Negro. This rare tinted print of body and soul is all that remains of his silent work. It was a different look at those rock-ribbed stalwarts of the black community, the church, and the preacher. Bot and Soul was released in several different versions, changing Paul from a crook to a crime-fighting preacher who rids the town of bootleggers. In this version, the wicked preacher has a twin brother, also played by ropes. The preacher drinks hard liquor, is a friend of gamblers and mobsters, assaults a girl, the daughter of one of his trusting parishioners, steals the mother's life savings, and brutally attacks the girl's brother who is trying to bring him to justice. Body and soul is startling in the power of Robeson's performance. All his promise as an actor and as a personality is apparent in scene after scene. Lorenzo Tucker, one of the stars who worked for Michaud, recalls. Uh, he would uh, uh, get uh, crunched over in the chair and behind the camera. He would go through all the motions. Uh, he would twist his mouth. And if you looked at him, it was almost like watching uh, a musical conductor with a bat top.
the death of the girl and the rest of the lurid melodramatic plot turns out to be a nightmare. The mother awakes and all ends happily. The good brother gets the girl. With no distribution organization, Oscar Michaud had to sell his own films door to door. When he took a movie on the road, it was always under his personal direction, slogging the countryside with the film cans under his arm. In one summer, he had Chattanooga, Birmingham, Bessemer, Shreveport, Spartanburg, Greenville, Durham, Mobile, and 15 other southern towns, selling his films to theaters who showed mostly split weeks and one-nighters. In Philadelphia, he once took in $3,000 for a single run. He took white money only when he had to. But Michaud brought more to movies than his black rivals. His movies exploited the sensibilities of the new black life. Michaud's only rival was the Colored Players Company of Philadelphia, whose social drama, Scar of Shame, topped off the 20s. A black vaudevillian, Sherman Dudley, fronted for two white journeyman producers. Together they made films with Charles Gilpin and other black stage actors of the day. Lucia Lynn Moses, one of the stars, remembers the making of the film. I was picked from a chorus line, and before I knew it, they had talked me into making this picture in Philadelphia. I was never an actress, and they just told me, walk over here, or walk over there, or do this or do the other, and I did exactly as they said. Every time I do something, they said it was great. So I must have been doing everything all right. shame delved into the then important issue of color caste snobbery within black circles, less pronounced than white man's segregation, but another burden for blacks to bear. This picture was made when black wasn't beautiful, but I remember colored people segregated each other. I wish the picture almost touched you that. If you were more educated, if one Negro was uh, better educated than another, they felt a little above the other one. Far more urbane and polished compared to most race movies, it told the story of a girl who was deceived into leaving her husband by a conniving nightclub owner and who commits suicide once she learns that her husband will marry a girl of his own set. But my baby sister had a beautiful dress and I said, look, Julie, can I borrow your dress for the movie I'm making over there? And she said, well, okay, but take care of it. And that's the dress you see in the last part of the picture. Everybody asked her, Julie, did you see Lucia's picture? She said, I didn't go to see Lucia, I went to see my dress. With Scar of Shame, the silent era came to an end. Misha had changed and refocused the image of the black man. But more important, their movies reached out to black audiences with inspirational messages, movie versions of black novels, and just good, crackling melodramas. Something of the complexities of the black life had finally been transposed to film. Then came the great crash of 1929. Race movies would never be the same.
1929. Fox made the first all-black sound feature, Hearts and Dixit, and nothing had changed. Along with the next decade of singing and dancing and comedy routines that would epitomize the black performer on the Hollywood screen, there were occasional flashes of Hollywood sensitivity to blacks. Still, black independents were hurt by each new intelligent use of a black performer in a Hollywood movie. I never going to forget what you've done for me. I'm going to study hard. And when I get to be a big doctor, I'll come back. You will never have to worry no more. I ain't worried no more, son. I know you're going to make me proud of you. At the beginning of the Depression, independent movie producers were set back even further by the advent of talkies. Sound film forced enormous investments in wiring theaters. Only the most prosperous houses could play talkies. The danger of creating visual cliches was compounded by the need to avoid verbal cliches as well. I'm only a young girl, just out of school. And my poor mother worked herself to death to send me through college and died saying that I would struggle hard and beat somebody. But my dear, I want to help you. I mean what I say. I want to marry you. Honestly? Do you mean it? Do you really want me to marry you? Why, of course. Amateurish acting could no longer be improved by shouting directors. All these problems were obvious in Michaud's picture, Ten Minutes to Live. It suffered from patchwork shoddiness, sparse sets, snippets of vaudeville routines, lack of continuity. We ought to do that. Sure. Get out of the gutter and get on the sidewalk. Now you talk. Follow him to put up a great man. Yeah. Men like Booker T. Washington. That's a great man. That's a man. His name is known everywhere. Yeah. The children know that his pictures in the books and papers. Why? Because he was a man that done something. Yeah. What did he do? I don't know, but whatever it was, he done it. Yeah. But that's a man. Who? Abraham Lincoln. That's a great boy. Now, that's a man that's known everywhere, too. Sure. That's he the... was a man that done something. Yeah. That, that's the boy that cut on his happy cherry tree. Black movie men suffered from poverty and lack of technical equipment and familiarity with a new medium. And as more theaters closed under the strain of the Depression, distribution became tougher than ever. Race movie exhibitors turned to the talents of American expatriate Josephine Baker as independent filmmakers went into temporary decline. Bursting with star quality, she might never have returned to America on film if J.A. Rogers of the Amsterdam News had not spotted the long lines outside Palace Aubert in Paris for her movie, Siren of the Tropics. The critics were divided. If they accepted La Baker as a rich black presence on the screen, the price seemed too high. Her tam-tams and zuzus symbolized the carefree joy of the natives, one of the very stereotypes that blacks were beginning to drive from the screen. The best of the overseas pictures were British and starred an on-again, off-again expatriate, the black star Paul Robeson. These are scenes from a film he made in England in 1935, Sanders of the River. The British colonial system was understandable to Americans because it resembled American racial arrangements. It encouraged black cultural assimilation while denying integration. Besides, if politics bored audiences, they could sit back and enjoy Robeson's powerful singing. Sandy the strong, Sandy the wise, writer of wrong, hater of lies, laughed as he fought, who worked as he played, as he has taught, 
Throughout the 30s, black Americans saw one of their heroes stand up to the British lion, even though the characters he played never questioned the lion's right to rule over his fellow blacks. Chiefs and people of the river, in the name of my king, I will give you a new king. Will you obey your king, Bosambo? Yes. Robeson always hoped for the best. He blamed the uneven results on the secrecy of the cutting room. These strange political ambiguities were lost on black American audiences. Well, Bosambo, you are king of the river. Your new people like you. I hope when I come back in 12 moons, they will still like you. Lord Sandy, I've learned the secret of government from your lordship. You have? It is this. A king ought not to be feared, but loved by his people. That is the secret of the British, Bosambo. Go now, my friend. Keep the peace of my king. Lord, I promise. One of his best films was not made in Europe or Africa at all but on Long Island. It was this superb version of Eugene O'Neill's play, The Emperor Jones, a monument to black expression. Trouble? Here I come. Producers John Kremsky and Gifford Cochran brought together an impressive roster of Check talent. Most of all, it featured the imposing presence of Robeson, as a Pullman porter, wise beyond his place in life, with an itch for power and a will to reach beyond his grasp. <laughs> Fire again! Don't you all know that I've got a charm? Takes a silver bullet to kill Brutus Jones. My turn now, General. Company, attention. I'm boss here now. King Brutus. No, somehow that don't make enough noise. Freddie Washington recalled. It's the things that he said, he said with such conviction He'd just carry you your way, and, and just the sound, melodious sound of his voice, number one, was so overpowering that you just, your jaws just hung. You look at the man, or I think almost everybody who ever had any contact with him got this sort of feeling from him. What he did was so right. What he said was so right. His talent was so right. No. You have just had an audience with the Emperor Jones. By the end of the Depression, Robeson's mix of internationalism, class consciousness, and race solidarity spoke to black nationalists, white liberals, and Marxists all at the same time. In the end, he dies as a result of black ambition, not black resignation. So long, white man. That's him. My men got silver bullets. Kill him, show. They got a silver bullet? Lead bullet, no kill him. Him got strong charm. I cook money, make silver bullets. Make strong charm, too. Where's all your eyes now, you blooming majesty? Still 
Anyhow, you died in the eye of Drawn as much by giveaways of free glassware and dishes, bingo, and air cooling, Americans sat out the Great Depression and moved their housing, their social attitudes gradually changing. During the early sound years, all the major studios in Hollywood made two real shorts featuring big name entertainers. Many of these were black musicians. Fortunately for succeeding generations, their performances were captured on film. Duke Ellington's Black and Tan Fantasy, 1929. Hey, what are you fellas doing coming in here like this? Brother, remove your anatomy from that mahogany. We come here to move it today. Well, you're not going to take my piano, are you? I ain't going to take your eyes, Bob. Sue, I've got some wonderful news. I've just landed a job in a nightclub, and I'm going to dance, and you're going to play. Isn't that wonderful? Calloway even appeared with Betty Boop a few years later. You got to hold the ho. You got a hold the ho. You got to hide the high. You got a hide the high. You got to heat the heat to get along with me. Yeah, man. When your sweetie tells you everything will be okay, just keep it the pop up and the good doop and the skilly big nip the pop up the big money. As competition toughened, the independent filmmakers polished. By 1933, Oscar Michaud had mastered sound techniques. This is his Girl from Chicago, a far cry from 10 Minutes to Live of just three years back. No end to theaters and... And nightclubs and good singing and dancing until the wee hours of the morning. We're going to hurt in New York, my baby. All of them under good time. Oh, kiss me again, sweetheart. Oh, 
Parker. Have you got your numbers ready? And how much did you play in this morning? I beg your pardon, sir, but I am not Mrs. Austin, and I do not play the numbers. Good day. Well, smack my mouth. By mid-decade, Hollywood slowly began to be sensitive to black needs and ideals, and occasionally, black actors stopped tap dancing and started to speak with conviction and intelligence. This sequence is from King Vida's So Red the Rose, made in 1935. During World War II, more social barriers were leveled. Back in the 1920s, passing for white was a subject fit for only one of Michaud's outspoken films. By 1949, Hollywood had caught up with him. 20th Century Fox starred Ethel Waters and Jean Crane in Pinky, the story of a girl who returns to her family in the South after living in Boston as white. The irony, of course, is that in spite of the many qualified black women who were fair enough and talented enough to play Pinky, Jean Crane, herself white, was chosen to play the lead. What is it, Pinky? Oh, I wish you'd never sent me away. You mean you wish you'd grow up ignorant, no count, good for nothing? You wish you'd never learn to read and write and make your way in the school? Oh, no, but don't you see? Yes, Pinky, I do see. Let me say something once and for all and never again. Why is you write me less and less as time go by? Why is it after you go to the hospital I get no letter at all? No, you don't need to say nothing. You think I don't know. You think poor old ignorant woman like me living in a shack like this don't know nothing. But you're wrong, Pinky. I do know. And I know what you've done. And you know I never told you pretend you is what you ain't. I didn't mean to, Granny. It just happened. But that's a sin before God and you know it. It was a conductor on the train. He put me back in another car. The white one. But he knowed who you was. I put you where you belong no, myself. No, no, it, it was after that. When they changed conductors. Then why you ain't tell the new conductor? Oh, Granny, I was only a child. Then what about school? What about that? Other children talk about their kinfolks, don't they? What you say when they ask you about yours? You tell them who your granny is? Oh, shame, shame be on you, Pinky. Denying yourself like Peter denied the good Lord Jesus. Here, get down. Get down. That's where you belong. Now you tell the Lord what you've done. Ask his forgiveness on your immortal soul. Then come on out here and get your breakfast. I don't want to hear another word from you about what you've done again as long as you live. Pat, look at me. Look at me. When you come to your senses, you've got to make a break. Get away from it. I don't want to get away from anything. I'm a Negro. I can't forget it and I can't deny it. I can't pretend to be anything else. And I don't want to be anything else. Don't you see, Tom? No, I don't. You can't live without pride. late thirties were the great age of race movies. They denied themselves no ambition. Everything was tried. Musicals like Heidi Ho. New York City's got subways. California's got warm days. 
Monte Carlo's got cafe. I got a girl named Mary. Westerns like bronze buckaroo. Gangster films. Come on. Come on, do that. Out of them holes. Come on and fight. You want to fight? Heroic biographies, as well as tributes to black life and culture. Well, I understand, Mr. Watson. The only way to get experience is to keep punching. You're a punching kid, all right, Henry. But race movies faced continual financial problems. They could command $3.50 for a ticket to a Harlem premiere. But a day or so later, they were back to split weeks in the bottom of double bills. Segregation never formalized in the North failed as a humiliating deterrent to black attendance in white theaters. In southern cities, race movers adopted a protective blindness in order to pass white censors. Black critics were genuinely puzzled by the race movers' failure to grasp the attention of a wide black audience. Gradually, the black producers turned to white backers in order to ride out the low spots in the waves of economic depression. Their future could be seen only in hazy outline. But for that moment, on the verge of war, race movies reached zenith. Some of the movie messages seemed to grow in social content. Moon over Harlem spoke to crucial issues with the added value of redeeming Harlem from social disaster and criminality. Listen to me. Don't pay any more shakedown money to these rats. Take a good look at the man who demands it of you. Stand by your guns and show these people that they can't take advantage of you. We'll do the rest. Listen, mister, whoever you is, I found out a long time ago that a half a loaf is better than none at all. I also found out that it's useless to argue with a guy who's got a gun in his stomach. And unless you and your organization can keep them guys from coming around to collect, I don't see how we can help ourselves. There'll be someone of this organization in your place of business who will be able to testify against these people. These one tenants of ours will save you the risk. All you've got to do is cooperate with me. A dramatic and professional peak was reached with Broken Strings, starring Clarence Muse. A classical violinist learns to appreciate jazz after injuring his hands. Now, very slowly, move your fingers. Can't move them. I can't move them. Keep Punching, a biography of boxing champion Henry Armstrong, made his life seem a sermon on hard work and clean living. What's her name? Her name is Fanny. Fanny Singleton. You know, Jerry, she didn't want me to be a fighter. She wanted me to continue my studies. I don't know how she feel about me now. Maybe I've proven a disappointment to her. That's why I've got to win this fight tonight. The insensitive makers of other race movies fell to grinding them out in two-day sessions, which prompted a critic to complain of amateurish filming, ludicrous situations, lousy sound recording, and willful violation of movie techniques. It should have been titled, Life is a Hustle. Let's get him into that close closet there. Race movies had provided a lone source of black folks on the screen. Now everyone did it. They had trained and provided work for a generation of blacks. Juan Hernandez, Ruby Dee, 
Laura Bowman. Now they had union cards and bungalows on Jefferson Boulevard. There was one last triumph, paradise in Harlem. It is the cause, it is the cause, my soul. Yet, she must die or she'll betray more men. Desdemona, that handkerchief that I so loved and gave to thee, thou gavest Cassio. No, no, my life, my love, my soul. Race movers were like the Negro National Baseball League before Jackie Robinson took his first swing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. For all their oppressive burdens of scant financing and isolation from sources of training and experience, they still provided images of black heroes and success models where there would have been none. Who could have foreseen that racial integration would have killed with surface kindness old black institutions before black Americans could create new alternatives. What seemed to some merely black shadows on a silver screen were heroes for two generations of black people whose self-expression reached far higher than the prancing, shuffling caricatures of black life which urban white America had inherited from its rural southern slave-ridden history. There's a kinship tonight that strikes here that will live forever in my memory. Something that only you and I can understand. The race movies and their creators spoke to a strong black consciousness and racial pride. The works of black artists like George and Noble Johnson, Lucia Lynn Moses, Oscar Michaud, and Clarence Muse can join the growing mountain of evidence that black movies were a rich contribution to our national culture. 